Apple and OpenAI are using each other. DeepCool probably can't be sold in the US anymore, and Intel doesn't like AMD's benchmarks. They're fake news. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Friday, June 14th, 2024. Happy Flag Day for you Americans out there. And happy uh, saving money to Apple and OpenAI because we talked about this in yesterday's episode of Hot News, how it wasn't quite clear what the terms of the deal were for ChatGPT to be integrated in all of the new Apple intelligence features that are gonna be rolling out on the latest software. And it turns out, at least according to the latest Bloomberg report, that there's no money changing hands at all. In fact, this is being done for what what amounts to exposure, with the Bloomberg reporter saying that Apple isn't paying OpenAI as part of the partnership. Instead, Apple believes pushing OpenAI's brand and technology to hundreds of millions of its devices is of equal or greater value than monetary payments. Essentially, hey, you're going to get so much exposure, we, we shouldn't have to pay you, which could also be brought to Apple's side, but I do think that Apple can make a stronger argument of they're just going to go without ChatGPT so maybe OpenAI needed this deal to happen, especially because Apple's running all of their own AI stuff on their own servers, which is made of their own silicon all in-house. But that shouldn't affect OpenAI's bottom line too much because according to their latest revenue report, they're making plenty of money, $3.4 billion in annual revenue with the bulk of that coming from the subscriptions that people pay to have just more tokens and the ability to have longer conversations with ChatGPT 4.0. Some of that comes from Microsoft and bigger deals, but it looks like for the most part, their subscription service for 20 bucks a month is what's actually making them quite a bit of money. And YouTube wants to make a little bit more money. So they're gonna be changing how ads get served to you when you're watching videos such as this one. This is part of an ongoing crackdown that's been happening ever since the latest CEO took power from Susan Wojcicki just a few years ago. And it's clear why he was behind DoubleClick, which was part of the ad revolution that was out on the internet. And so he's trying to make sure that YouTube is making more money than ever. And so the changes that are gonna be happening that are currently in beta testing and may not roll out fully is that they're gonna be server-side injecting ads directly into the video, which is different than how it works now. Right now, the ads are injected to you, the viewer, but the difference here, at least according to SponsorBlock, who's reporting on all of this, is that it's actually gonna interrupt the video itself and be in line, so it's much harder to actually have ad blockers skip them, especially because they might not happen at predictable intervals or at predictable timings where you can easily skip it like a traditional ad blocker, making it more difficult. So sponsor block says that they're gonna be keeping an eye on all of this and trying to make sure that they have a handle on how all of this works, but YouTube as well does a lot of tests like this that never actually make it to fruition. But typically when we hear about big public tests like this, they end up working their way out down the line, but we'll see how this happens. But YouTube has been definitely fighting this ad block game for quite some time, especially with recent moves like if you actually try to embed it on a third-party service when you have adblock installed you're not going to be able to watch the video there it's a complicated tango that ad blockers and YouTube have been playing for quite some time and now in the complicated tango of international politics let's talk about deep cool for a second because yesterday the US announced new sanctions against Russia with the ongoing war in Ukraine one of the things that came out was that deep cool is now getting sanctioned by the US government for selling over a million dollars worth of common high priority goods to Russia, which was not allowed under previous sanctions, and so Deepcool themselves are being sanctioned. Which practically means that the U.S. subsidiary of Deepcool here in the States has to stop all sales and other operations immediately. They cannot transact any business with any retailers like Amazon, Newegg, or any other storefront. And according to the U.S. government, they say that all transactions by U.S. persons or within or transiting the United States that involve any property or interest in property of designated or otherwise blocked persons are prohibited unless authorized by a general or specific license issued by OFAC or exempt. These prohibitions include the making of any contribution or provision of funds, goods, or services by, to, or for the benefit of any blocked person, the receipt of any contribution or provision of funds, goods, or services from any such person. So if you're trying to buy a deep cool product, you're technically violating that sanction that the US government has issued. That's at least the way it seems from most interpretations of what I've seen here. Deep cool, not a company that the US can interact with 
currently at the moment. As of the time of recording, we haven't had any response from Deepcool themselves on this or what the situation is gonna be moving forward. And as of the time of recording, you could still buy these products on the retailers like Micro Center, Newegg, and Amazon. But even if you clicked purchase, it's hard to say whether or not they would actually fulfill those orders considering this whole situation. We'll keep you updated if there's any changes to this whole situation or if there's divestment between the US arm of Deepcool and Beijing Deepcool, which is its parent company. And we'll see how it all plays out in the future. While Reese over in South Africa plays out by giving you some deals on non deep cool products. Yo, welcome back to Yifty Deals, bringing the hottest tech deals out on the internet. It is another freezing day here for me, but hey, we've got some hot deals for you. Starting off with this Royal Clutch RK71 70% wireless mechanical gaming keyboard with blue switches for only $49.99, making it $20 off. And then next, we're continuing our Ryzen 5000 streak with the Ryzen 5 5600 GT desktop processor for only $105.99, making it $34.01 off for an AM4 chip with integrated graphics. And then lastly, we have this Superflower Letex Platinum SE 1000 watt 80 plus platinum fully modular power supply available in white for only $144.99 with included promo code making it $105 off the total price. And hey, with that, the deals are done. You can find these and more linked in the video description down below. But until next time, I'm gonna hand you off back to Brett for the rest of your hot news. Cheers. Well, Reese, PlayStation 5 owners get a better deal when it comes to trying to use Discord on the PS5. Now Discord calls can be made natively within the PlayStation. In case you weren't familiar, the way you had to do it before was bust out your phone. You can make calls on your PS5, but you had to transfer it from your mobile device. Now you can actually start and have those conversations directly on the PS5 within Discord, which is a nice little update. And Qualcomm wants to let you know about the nice little update that they have in the Adreno X1 GPU that's going to be coming out in the Snapdragon X chips that are supposed to launch this coming Tuesday on June 18th. They have an architecture breakdown in case you're interested in a lot of these details, showing the different various components that make up the actual GPU and even showing some comparison benchmarks to Intel's integrated GPU. However, it's the previous one from Meteor Lake. We already had some details that I covered in a sponsored video by Intel about their Lunar Lake XE2 graphics, showing that that is potentially going to be up to 50% better. So it's not really comparing against what it's going to be competing with out on the market. And also, more importantly, forgetting Intel's Meteor Lake and Lunar Lake for a second, it's not comparing itself to AMD's RDNA 3 graphics in like a 8840HS or an 8840U. Just they're, uh, they're definitely choosing what is probably the weaker of the integrated graphics that's currently out on the market to do that. But we'll get more third party benchmarks coming out as soon as these things are supposed to be hitting shelves next week. I'm not sure if there's a review embargo where we're going to get reviews of Snapdragon laptops earlier, but let me know down below in the comments in case you want me to pick up a Snapdragon X laptop that I, I could do a review on. I'm interested. I'm considering it as a possibility, so you let me know if you'll want to see that on UFD Tech. And Intel's letting AMD know that they don't want to see their benchmarks the way that they've been done no more, because at Computex, AMD put out some AI benchmarks with regards to its 128 core Epic turn chip, and Intel feels like they didn't get a fair shake. And we're not talking by a few percentage points. No, Intel's saying that the way AMD benchmarked it was an inaccurate representation of Xeon's performance and that Intel's chips were 5.4 times faster under their own benchmarking. But part of the problem here is that AMD didn't disclose how they benchmarked their chips. So Intel used a pre-existing standard benchmark that's typically used for int 4 testing with Llama 2 and then published all of the details on how they they do the benchmarkings. This is actually something that comes up when I do sponsored videos with Intel. They actually have to make sure that all of the benchmarks we publish are following their guidelines and all of the comparisons and claims that they make in their stuff. One of the reasons you can get controversies like way back in the day when they have the core of the Ryzen 7 2700X is because they publish it. They actually let you know how they're benchmarking things and it appears that AMD is not quite doing that but making claims that their chips are significantly faster, even though under Intel's testing, Intel's CPU competes with AMD's next gen. So it's hard to say who's right here. Obviously, Intel publishing how they benchmark, I think is the better and clearer way to go for the end consumer. But also one of the things that's coming out, especially as AI benchmarking and workloads are starting to be standardized, is that both Intel and NVIDIA submit their stuff to the MLPerf database to verify AI benchmarks. And AMD doesn't. 
AMD isn't submitting their hardware to MLPerf, at least currently out on the moment. So it's hard to really know or trust or feel like they have a handle on what they're trying to accomplish with their benchmarking. But it's just funny. We're seeing this go back and forth. You got things like snake oil claims by Intel, which were particularly egregious. AMD obviously having some situations where Intel is not giving them the benefit of the doubt. And now we're finding another situation where that's playing out. Just remember, it's always in their vested interest to stack the deck and show themselves in the best light as possible, just like we talked about in that Qualcomm Adreno X1 chip. They're comparing themselves against Intel because it, it's it's better for them to do that. Why would they compare themselves against AMD? And I'm going to compare myself against your comments from yesterday's episode of Hot News, which <laughs> a lot of you let me know that I messed up. I said it was April 13th. Don't know why I did that. Probably jet lag. Probably I'm still a little tired from Taiwan. I trans transported back two months. I'm so sorry for that. In case you use me to actually dictate what day of the week it is for you. Whoops. And then we got Bonkus Maximus saying, genuine question. How can the pin comment be one hour ago, but the video was posted 47 seconds ago? This is actually a feature that YouTube has where you can pin comments when the video is unlisted. So that's before you guys get to see it. And since we have an actual com common release time for hot news, which is 9 a.m. Eastern, the video is always gonna get published then. So whenever the video is edited and uploaded, that's when we're gonna pin the comment. And that can be anywhere from like, a an hour to maybe two or three hours before 9 a.m. Eastern, depending on the length of the episode. So that's how it happens. It's just a little behind the scenes magic in case you've never uploaded to YouTube yourself. It's a good question. And then we got Linux sucks 41 saying, Microsoft, we have recall. Brett, boo, that seems invasive and a data security risk. Apple, we are doing the same thing. Brett, well, they promised to be good, so this one is okay. I think that's a gross oversimplification of how I evaluate this situation. The big problem I had with recall is not what it's doing, but how Microsoft is choosing to actually store that information this was already shown to be a problem. They were storing passwords and financial documents in plain text, and Microsoft said that's by design. That's the big problem, and it wasn't opt-in. And as far as we knew, it didn't even have an opt-out situation. So not only was it plain text, unencrypted, it was also something that was going to be forced on everybody who had a qualifying PC. A lot of that changed, where it's now opt-in, and they are hiding it behind biometric authentication through Windows Hello. I think that solves a lot of the problems. I don't really have a problem with Windows Recall. I think it's an actual valuable technology for a lot of people. But storing my passwords in plain text because you saw me type them in as a keylogger and making it so that it's hard to prevent that from happening is the real problem. When you look at Apple intelligence, number one, it's opt-in. Number two, it's all encrypted and it's all held behind biometric authentication on the device. It has very little to do with Apple promising to be good, but it, instead it's Apple has already done things like this and shown that yes, they're gonna encrypt these things. Microsoft was saying, we're not encrypting it and it's always gonna be on, so suck it. Very different situations. Now that Microsoft has hit it behind Windows Hello, I think that's a better situation. Now that they've made it opt-in, that's a better situation. It comes down to what the company is communicating in terms of intent. Obviously, you still need to verify, is Microsoft properly encrypting all of this? Are they doing it in the way they said that they were gonna do? And the same thing needs to be verified on Apple's side, but the, the difference in the, the, the conversation that I think I'm having is Microsoft is saying, hey, <laughs> we made it unsecure by design for fun. It's for you to, to just be able to read. And Apple's saying, we don't want to do that. We're going to do it the opposite way. So if Apple breaches that, that's actually a bigger indication of a problem because they're hiding things or potentially they have severe vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. So that also needs to be watched out for. But when you find out Microsoft's storing your passwords in plain text, they're like, yeah, system works. Good stuff, which I, I, I didn't like, but I'm an Apple shill. I forgot about that. So, you know. Whoops, see, see you back here for more of the hottest tech news on Monday.